Okay. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the Called Out Church. Thanks for listening online. Let's go ahead and go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come to you this evening. We thank you for bringing this word. We thank you for the study of Romans. And we ask that you help us take these uh, teachings to heart. Let us understand them to their fullest extent. In Jesus' name, amen. So, we've been in Romans. We did Romans 1. We did Romans 2. And we were kind of looking and seeing, you know, how much the law affected judgment of things and, and it brought to light an understanding of what God's standard is and because of that right it rolls right into Romans 3 and we we pick up on an understanding of wait okay so there's this judgment that God dishes out in Romans 1 and then we look at other people judging other people in Romans 2 but then now we start to roll into Romans 3 because the Jews were thinking of themselves as superior beings towards the rest of the world, the Gentiles, even though they're still God's children as well, and even though they may be following the law without even knowing the law, they are more a Jew than the actual Jews who break the law but profess it, right? So now, let's get into Romans 3. And now we're really going to take this thing and put it together. This is, uh, to me, where we really define what grace is, is starting right here in Romans 3. So, let's go ahead and jump right in. So, Romans 3, verse 1. What advantage, then, has the Jew, or what is the profit of circumcision? Much in every way chiefly because to them were committed the oracles of God. Now, I want you to understand what that actually means as we're talking about the prophets. The prophets of God were committed to who? The Jews. God called the prophets out of Israel. Okay? And so, so what profit is it to live by the law? It profits much in every way is what Paul is saying. Why? Because we are getting an understanding of what God's standard is through the law. What is clean? What is unclean? What are all the advantages of living in a way that God says? Here is a godly route. Here is a godly standard. But now we have a little bit different understanding through grace that we are not held to that standard like to the tape, right? Because we live by faith and not by the law anymore. So let's let's continue on with this, okay? So verse three. For what if some did not believe? Will their unbelief make the faithfulness of God without effect? Certainly not. Indeed, let God be true, but every man a liar, as it is written, that you may be justified in your words. And may overcome when you are judged. The point Paul is trying to get across is where a lot of Christians nowadays fail. They put their faith in people over God. And what he is trying to say is let every man be a liar. Look, it doesn't matter, right? If you see somebody professing the law or professing truth, but they go against that truth, the truth is still the truth. And even though they are a fallen being, let's let's carry on. But keep that keep that up here. So verse 5. But if our right unrighteousness demonstrates the righteousness of God, what shall we say? Is God unjust who inflicts wrath? I speak as a man. Certainly not for then how will God judge the world? For if the truth of God has increased through my lie to his glory, why am I also still judged as a sinner? And why not say, let us do evil that good may come, as we are slanderously reported, and have some affirm that we say their condemnation is just. We got a bunch of people doing some stupid stuff, right? They're going against what God's standard is, what God's truth is, and, 
And yet, right, think about this. You've got a bunch of pastors having some extracurricular activities outside the marriage, right? They wholeheartedly believe in God, but they have fallen. And what happens, right? They're, they're trying to do something good for God, but they are a man and they have fallen and they have done something bad. They have done something wrong. And an entire church family splits, right? Now, Paul's not saying he agrees with what the man is doing, but your <coughs> faith in God should not be determined by what a man does. We already know every single man on this earth, woman, child, will let you down. Right? It happens. It happens. Yet people allow people to get in between them and God. Well, you were putting somebody in the wrong place, right? We cannot allow people to get in between us and God, right? That's how we get in that shadow. That's how we get that shadow and that darkness because getting, right, something in between you and God, the light source, will cast a shadow on you and now you're in the darkness. Why? Because your relationship wasn't directly with God. It was going through a person. There's only one person your relationship should ever go through, and that's Jesus Christ. Right? The source. The word. The truth. The light. You should be directly connected to him because at any point, somebody may let you down. It may happen. But it does not take all the truth that they ever spoke to you, and now you can't just call it a lie, right? Perfect example. There's a lot of people that say translations have inaccuracies in our Bible. Is the whole thing untrue now? Because of one or two mistakes when somebody transcribed. When somebody did a bad translation, is the whole thing of no effect? No. No, because... At any point, the whole doctrine of that Bible, Jesus Christ, everything pointing towards him is still the truth of what that Bible professes. Because somebody put an A or a period in the wrong place does not mean that whole Bible is not accurate. You following what I'm saying? The same way a lot of times as Christians, we treat other Christians, they, they made a mistake. Stop treating them as if they are supposed to be perfect. They are still loved by God. We should not shun them, but we should correct each other. You following? Okay. So, <coughs> verse 9. What then? Are we better than they? Not at all. For we have previously charged both Jews and Greeks that they are all under sin. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks after God. They have all turned aside. They have together become unprofitable. There is none who does good. No, not one. This is Isaiah, by the way. This is Paul quoting Isaiah. Okay? Who is one of the prophets who we brought up at the beginning of this. But he is speaking the words of God. God has said this to us. Nobody lives up to the standard that he has set forth. No, not one. This is before Jesus was born as a man. Okay? Verse 13. Their throat is an open tomb. With their tongues they have practiced deceit. The poison of ass is under their lips. Uh, lips whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways, and they and the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. That's pretty, that's pretty rough, right? That's God pointing a finger, saying, Look, I have set a standard, and not one of you has lived up to it. Not even to the point, like as much as you like to lift yourself up and think so highly of yourself, 
Let's look at the bare truth of this. And God's describing something out of everyone. Right? Ever told a lie? Deceit is on their lips. On their lips. They're swift to destruction. Right? Swift to shed blood. Misery and destruction, right? Like, that's us without the Holy Spirit. Okay? I want us to understand that number, number one. Without the Holy Spirit inspiring us and teaching us and leading us and guiding us, that's what we look like. That's how God sees us. Now, once we receive, let's get into a little bit lighter, a little bit nicer, a little bit like, ooh, okay, here we go. Verse 19. Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. So if God knew that when we got the law, we would still break it, then how in the world are we supposed to do this thing? The whole point being is you can't do this thing by yourself. The whole time pointing forward towards Jesus saying, look, Here's the standard which you cannot meet. This is how holy I am, is what God is saying. Here's the standard. This is what I need you to do if you want to be. But also that we see, where is it? Oh. That every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified. You can't get there by your works. As good as you think you are, as soon as you realize you have been a bad person and you try to do nothing but good for the rest of your life, it will never amount to outweigh. You can't do this balance in the scales act. It doesn't work. It doesn't happen. No, right? Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified. Your most holy is filthy rags. Right. Your holiness is like filthy rags to God. You got to understand that. You can't do this by yourself. And when you break yourself down and you realize this is what humility, true humility is, is when you humble yourself before God and realize this is what that whole acceptance of Christ is. It's not belief in, it's accepting Him as your Savior, as your sacrificial lamb. You see, it's not a, I believe in Him, it is, no. I've screwed up so bad, I can't fix it. But He can. You following that? Because none of my deeds are going to make up for what I can be without him right I need him I must have God in my life and I have to love him you following he gave us the law so that we can have a moral standard that we understand or taught and then realize that we need somebody to help us get to that next level and when we have Jesus right now and, and we have the law we get this understanding of why we need a sacrifice. You following me? Only through understanding what the law is and by not being able to meet that standard do you realize your need for Jesus. Good enough? Okay. So, verse 41. Now, anybody that wants to tell you that you are saved by your works. You need to point them right here. Romans 3, verse 21, and tell them to keep reading. So, but now the righteousness of God, apart from the law, apart from the law, is revealed. 
being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ, to, to all and on all who believe. Did you hear that? God's righteousness on who? On all who believe, on all who have faith in Jesus. See, we started this thing, and God looking at you is just, oh, not one of them is good. Not one. But now, Paul has switched the tone, and now he's starting to tell us about the righteousness of Jesus Christ that is then rested on us, and is now how God sees us when we have faith in Jesus Christ. That is what grace is. That you could do all those nasty, horrible, hateful things that you have ever done in your life that were against God's standard. Right? And now we have realized that we need Jesus to help clean that up inside us. And through faith in that and him being our sacrificial lamb, God now looks at us the same way he looks at his son. As righteous. You following? Okay. So. Right here. Halfway through 22. For there is no difference. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Being justified freely. By his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Whom God set forth as a propitiation by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance God has passed over the sins that were previously committed everything in the past Jesus blood has covered you become the righteousness of Christ when you put your faith in him that he did what he said he was going to do all the way back from when the prophets spoke it, Jesus said it himself, right? And then three days later, he was going to raise the temple. The temple being what? This, the body. He raised the temple of God back from the dead. And then he sent his spirit to live inside you, right? So, and it was all bought, right, through atonement of the blood. Okay? So, let's see. Verse 26. To demonstrate at the present time his righteousness that he might be just in the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Did y'all hear that? He might be just and the justifier. Jesus is the one who is just. He is the one that lived to the standard. Right? And he's also the justifier of those who have broken the standard. You can't do this. Nothing you can do or say or try will make you righteous. Only accepting what Jesus has done for you will make you righteous. I gotta have you, Jesus. I can't do this without you. A humility, a letting go of that pride, of wanting to be in control, you gotta let it go. You can't do this on your own. You have to have God and his influence, his son and his spirit all up in here. Without it, there's no hope. What hope do you have? As, as much as you try, you screw it up. But as soon as you let God have control of things, now we're starting to work it all out for his good. The greater good, right? Okay, so, Jesus is the justifier, not you. Through faith, through faith, through faith. Verse 27. Where is boasting then? 
he, he, he starts that way right here because what can you say about this? You didn't do it. There's nothing that you can claim to yourself that says you are awesome and that you did all of this and you saved yourself. No, you did not. You have to point it all back to his son and say, he did it for me. He paid the price. He offered himself up for me. So, where is boasting then? It is excluded by what? Law of works? Not yours, right? No, but by the law of faith. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith apart from the deeds of the law. Or is the God of the Jews, or excuse me, or is he the God of the Jews only? Is he not also God of the Gentiles? Yes, of the Gentiles also, since there is one God who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith. It's all about faith apart from the deeds of the law. Your salvation rests in your faith in Jesus Christ alone. Whether you follow what the Spirit is calling you into is a part from your salvation. And you have to be able to separate those two things. It's right there, black and white or blue and blue, right? You got to be able to understand that Jesus' salvation over top of you, right? You don't earn it. You do not earn your salvation. He paid it. He did it. You cannot pay for a gift. A gift comes freely. Right? Christmas, your birthday, whatever. People give you gifts and you don't get your wallet out and say, well, how much do I owe you? It don't work like that. A gift is a gift and it comes freely. You accept it or not. You open the present or not. You unpack it and take it out of the box and use it or not. Or you take it and you shove it in a closet and you never look at it again and you say, no, thank you, I don't want it. Still, the gift was given, but it's up to you whether you unpack the box or not. Right? So, let's see, where are we at? Verse 31. Do we then make void the law through faith? Certainly not. On the contrary, we establish the law. How? Why? That's a very bold statement. We're going fast today. If y'all don't realize that this is the last verse. It is very plain and simple that when you receive the Spirit of God, you change. When he puts the Spirit in here, he writes the laws upon your heart. The things that you know you should and should not be doing come by the teaching of the Holy Spirit which resides in you from the point you receive Christ and you put your faith in Him and what He did on that cross for you and all those stripes that He took to heal you, all the beatings and bruising to take away your iniquities, your sins, your bad thoughts, all the things that go on in here that disagree, right? Jesus even said, Himself. If you even hate somebody else, you might as well be committing murder, right? So even the things that happen in here, we may not be doing it out front in front of everybody, but we're doing some things up here that God does not agree with. Our iniquities, our shortcomings, our our emotional downfalls, right? And then on top of that, all the stuff that we actually do let out of the cage, right? So, Jesus paid for all that stuff, but then when you receive the Spirit, He gives you a way now to fight against all that stuff so that God's standard can start to be established through you. He says, on the contrary, right? Do we make void the law? No. We 
we begin to live it out, even though we don't even okay. fully follow it and look at it and read it. We're not even trying to do the right thing anymore. We are letting the Spirit lead us to the right thing. And we just, all of a sudden, start doing as God would have us to do. A lot of people think they got to be perfect the day they become a Christian. That's a bold-faced lie. No, what you got to do is you got to listen to what's happening in here. The teacher's teaching, are you listening? If you're not, right, it's much easier to listen what's going on in here than it is to try and think it through and walk it out that way. You let God impress upon you what's right and wrong for you to be doing, not doing. There's freedom and liberty in being a Christian. Well, it says, you know, when I leave, I'm going to send a comforter and a teacher. That's right. That's what that is. In a nutshell. When he leaves, Absolutely. he took the law and so he got back door. Pretty much. You no longer, I mean, he for goodness good. sake, if y'all don't actually realize how good we have it, you need to go read Leviticus and then you're just going to pull your eyeballs out. But to the point, right? Has anybody ever touched a dead animal? Well, yes, Dave. <laughs> right? Yeah. Now you're unclean. Because you touched that dead animal, you have to wash your hands, right? You got to take a bath. You got to do all these different steps and. 24 hours later, now you're clean. I mean, that's like breaking all those little laws and ordinances, they are ridiculous and you can never live up to that standard. And the priests that would go to be in God's presence, if they were not absolutely perfect in walking that out, and they got in God's presence, they died. They died going into the presence of Right where God is in the mercy seat in the holy of holies, and they had to tie the rope around their leg and drag them out. If they didn't walk it out, if they didn't live it, if they did not do it just so and perfectly, to make sure. And and we're not even talking about sin right now. We're talking about being clean or unclean. If they didn't get that part right, they would die. And now we got to make sure our sins are atoned for. So now we got to sacrifice a bunch of animals. You have to start to look at that that uh, law to really realize and appreciate how much Jesus actually paid for the price. Right, the price was very steep for you. Go read Leviticus and God, like. You'll really begin to appreciate how much Jesus actually paid. It's not just your ticket to heaven. That ain't it. It's so much more than that. All right? With that said, I hope everybody's starting to get that good understanding or feeling of what grace actually is. It's, it's got not so much to do with you, but more so to do with what Jesus has done for you. Right? And then when you understand that and you put your faith in that and everything that he did for you, now it's applied to you. What was applied to the Son is now applied to you. And you've got all that language all through Romans. Co heirs of all creation with Christ, and so on and so forth. But with that said, short night. Everybody look like they're about to fall asleep on me anyway. <laughs> so, uh, Danny, if you would pray, sir. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus, and we just want to thank you for your son and everything you've done on the cross for us, Father. Because if it wasn't for him, we would be in a heck of a mess. Lord, I just thank you for the people here, and I just pray for each and every one of us to go boldly out these doors and spread the love of Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.